to the 2013 Winter Lecture Series. Um, we are very excited to have all of you here this year. We are also very, very grateful to the First Baptist Church for providing the venue and all the wonderful refreshments to kick off this year's lecture series. Uh, also, you may notice if you've been to our previous lecture series that th these are going to be a little different because they are being videotaped. Thanks to a grant um, provided by the Coastal Community Foundation, we are able to videotape our speakers and then we'll be streamlined on ETV for, teach for um, teachers. And I also want to thank all the teachers who are present here tonight, particularly those who are going to um, provide lesson plans to go along with the lectures. As a former educator, I know what that means, so thank you very much. Um, I am very excited about this year's series. I'm, I'm just thrilled um, uh, about all our speakers who are giving their time. Um, because they're all authorities on these subjects. As you probably know, we are focusing on South Carolina firsts, the things that our state did first, and there are a lot of them, so we sort of had to be particular. And uh, so, so we're just doing a few this year. As a matter of fact, there's so many firsts in South Carolina, we may continue this series next year. Uh, first order of business before we get started is that I need to ask you now to check your cell phone, Make sure it is turned off. And now we get started. I want to introduce tonight's speaker. Our lecturer tonight is distinguished Professor Emerita Constance Schultz. For over 20 years, Connie was director of the award-winning public history program at the University of South Carolina. While at USC, she was also managing editor of the papers of Henry Lawrence. Connie earned her BA at Worcester College and her MA and PhD at the University of Cincinnati. She has written on public history education, she served as a consultant for colleges and universities, and she studied how museum, archival, and historic preservation activities are carried out in the United States and in other nations as well. Her work as a scholar and an archival educator, beginning with the Maryland, South Carolina, and American History Slide Collections, has focused on the importance of archivist preservation and historians' use of visual images, particularly photographs. I have to tell you, I was going to list her publications, <laughs> but we'd be here all night, and I know you really want to hear her. So I'm not going to list Connie's uh, publications, but you should know that she has been a Fulbright lecturer in both England and Italy. She was an NHPRC fellow in documentary editing, and she was awarded the Robert Kelly Award for Lifetime Achievement in Public History. Currently, she serves as director and senior editor of an NEH-funded project, which is titled The Digital Documentary Edition of the Writings of Eliza Lucas Pinckney and Harriet Pinckney Ori. Now, since the South Carolina Historical Society holds many of the papers being digitized for this project, we are particularly pleased to have Connie with us tonight to speak on Eliza, and Harriet and their legacy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Connie Schultz. And I am of a certain age, so I have to put my glasses on. And I've got some show and tell. I think I can do this without dropping everything on the floor. And so that I can more or less stick to your timetable, uh, although I love to speak extemporaneously, I am going to try to follow a script so that we actually cover what I want to, what I want to cover. Well, let me start out by saying I am delighted to be here as your guest and speaker. 
it is a very special honor to be the first to speak in the South Carolina Historical Society's first and foremost lecture series. I think that many of you will have heard of the first of my two women, Eliza Lucas Pinckney, whose fame began more than 200 years ago when David Ramsey, in his History of South Carolina from its first settlement in 1670 to the year 1808, credited her with being the first to develop indigo into a successful commercial commodity. Now, there are scholars who argue that she wasn't really totally the first she was certainly among the first, and, and she was part of the group, um, along with her husband, who made that happen. So we'll say that she was the first. Um, but I suspect that apart from the coastal familiarity that you will have with the family name of Ori, relatively few of you probably know much about her daughter, Harriet Pinckney Ori. What I hope to do this evening is to introduce you, let's make this work, is to introduce you to these two women to argue that they deserve to be considered among the foremost women of the American founding era of the revolutionary generation. And I hope to share with you some of the pleasure that I have experienced first in researching and writing their biographies, and then over the past four years, editing the considerable body of their papers, a great many of which are among the collections of the South Carolina Historical Society. Um, the other major body of their papers are at the Library of Congress. Um, they are on deposit there. They're not owned by the Library of Congress. The, the Pinckney family, put them on deposit at the Library of Congress's manuscript collection in 1938. And there they remain. They're still owned by the family, but they're open to scholars to do research. And what I've done is to put up for you, I hope that there will be some time that I can actually show you what a scholarly digital edition looks like and how it works uh, for about five minutes at the end. But I wanted to show you the home page of the digital edition. I first began exploring the life and times of Eliza Pinckney in 1988, shortly after I had moved to South Carolina to teach at USC in the fall of 1985. Catherine Clinton, who is one of the leading historians of Southern women, she's written a half dozen books um, on uh, antebellum and Civil War era Southern women, um, asked if I would write a brief overview of Pinckney's life for a book called Portraits of American Women, which was to be used in survey US history classes. Now, mind you, this is when the whole birth of the field of women's history was very new, and women didn't get mentioned in survey US history classes. And so she just wanted to create a book that would mention them. And I said, Eliza Pinckney, who's that? But I soon knew, and I became fascinated with her, and I discovered her daughter, Harriet. So, fast forward um, 20 years, or not quite 10 years, uh, I was invited by my friend Holly Schulman, who was the editor of the digital edition of the papers of Dolly Madison, to consider adding Eliza Lucas Pinckney to a larger enterprise Holly wanted to put together of digital publication of founding mothers. We have founding fathers. Can't we have founding mothers? Um, I included Harriet Ori in that, and thus we have both of them. And this is um, We Too, the Dolly Madison Digital Edition and the Pinckney Ori Digital Edition are still the only major uh, born digital scholarly editions of writings of the revolutionary era. I was also invited about the same time to, um, to add a chapter, and you should know about this series, if I can hold up my show and tell. Um, I was invited to write a chapter on Harriet and Eliza for a book uh, 
on South Carolina women, their lives and times. The third volume was just published, um, but Eliza and Harriet, a much fuller story about them, are in volume one of um, South Carolina women. The project was eventually published um, by the University of Virginia Press as the papers of Eliza Pinckney and Harriet Pinckney O'Ree. Uh, it was funded very generously by the National Endowment for the Humanities, and I'm currently working on a similar edition of what I'm calling the Pinckney Revolutionary Era Statesman, for which I'm waiting to hear whether NEH will fund that. I continue to find these women remarkably interesting with remarkably similar profiles. Both spent time as children in England, and their correspondence reveals them to have been well-educated there and elsewhere. They remained intellectually curious throughout their lives. Both, remained, both married relatively young. Eliza was 22 at her marriage, um, and Harriet was 19. Both had, for their time, relatively small families. Eliza bore three, Harriet only two. Both were widowed quite young. Eliza was widowed at the age of 36, Harriet at 37. And as a result, they spent the, the greater part of their long lives administering the plantations left to their care on behalf of their sons. Each had an interest in agricultural and botanical experimentation and development. Each was in her own way an interesting and very creative writer. Eliza kept a letter book of her correspondence for more than 25 years, and Harriet recorded her travel in three remarkable travel journals, uh, as well as keeping several much shorter, um, much more sporadic letter books of her own. I have to tell you that there is no known visual image of Eliza Lucas Pinckney, nor is there any extant financial or other record, even a family legend, of her likeness ever have, having been made. So the image that generations have had of her since her death is based on her surviving writings. From her words, there emerges a portrait of a woman of strong character and strong emotions, a woman of faith and intelligence. We have, um, or the Historical Society has some wonderful uh, collections of her prayers for special occasions. Um, she was a woman with curiosity and the capacity for long-lasting friendships, people that she had met as a child um, in school in England in the 1730s, she was still corresponding with almost near her death in 1793. She was born in December of 1722 on the island of Antigua. She was one of the four surviving children of George Lucas, who was a planter and a soldier, and his wife, although there's some question, no one can find their marriage lines, were they ever really married? But we say yes, she was his wife. She certainly bore him four children, uh, and her name was Anne Mildrum. George Lucas was a second generation Antiguan who served as Lieutenant Governor of the island and as a major in the 38th Regiment of the British Army. As a young girl, Eliza Lucas spent several years in school in England, but she had returned to Antigua by 1737 or 38. And by 1739, Eliza, her parents, and her younger sister Polly, quite a bit younger sister Polly, had moved to South Carolina. Now, her grandfather, John Lucas, had previously acquired several properties that produced rice and supplies for the West Indian colonies. And you need to be aware, we think of the sugar plantations as being producers of great wealth for the English aristocrats who invested in them, hoping to make their fortune. But it cost a great deal. Um, it was the, the slave labor population um, dropped like flies. The work was horrible. They died quickly. They had to reinvest in the labor force. And so um, 
John Lucas had hoped to recoup his fortune and get out of his debt by investing in rice plantations in South Carolina. And in the 1730s, late 1730s, when um, George Lucas brought his family to South Carolina, um, sugar planting was really, uh, he was deeply in debt, and there was a growing demand for rice because of the warfare between the Spanish, French, and English that, um, that rice was a, a growing commodity to, to get invested in. There is some controversy about exactly when the Lucas family came to South Carolina. Um, I have accepted the detailed evidence assembled by Harriet Simons Williams in an essay um, entitled Eliza Lucas and Her Family Before the Letter Book, published in the South Carolina Historical Magazine in 1998. And I have to tell you, this entire issue, um, if you're interested in Eliza, uh, this entire issue is about Eliza Lucas Pinckney, so it's a good one to um, go check out at the library. In South Carolina, the Lucas family seat was at Wapu Plantation, and let me see if I can find that for you. I can't, I think that's, if I got it on Wapu, there. Um, but it was one of three. Now, they came probably sometime in the spring of 1739, but the summer of 1739, war broke up out again. Uh, the, the resumption of what we know collectively as the French and Indian Wars, um, war broke out and her father, George Lucas, had to go back to Antigua. He's lieutenant governor and he's major in the army. So he leaves 17-year-old Eliza behind to manage these three plantations. Um, her mother was always somewhat sickly. So it's at that time that Eliza begins keeping a letter book of her correspondence with her father and with her friends. The letter book was originally published in a limited edition by her great-granddaughter, Harriet Pinckney Rutledge Holbrook, in 1850. Many of you will know, um, those of you who know something about her, know that there was an absolutely wonderful edition of that letter book published in 1972 uh, by one of her descendants, Elise Pinckney. And Elise, I believe, some of you may, I think is still alive, is living in a, in a, in a retirement community on, on Mount Pleasant, yeah. Um, Elise did wonderful work. Uh, I would argue that Elise Pinckney is probably much of the reason for Eliza Lucas Pinckney's current day fame because it became available for scholars to read and study just as the field of women's history was emerging and was one of the few sources available um, for Southern women's history in the early 1970s. So, get rid of my props here. It's because of the letter book that we know about Eliza's management of her father's three plantations, her friendship with Charles Pinckney uh, and his wife Elizabeth, his first wife Elizabeth, his courtship of Eliza after Elizabeth's death. And the, her, the family lore is that Elizabeth, the first, they're both named Elizabeth, but Eliza is always known as Eliza. Uh, and there's both family lore and, and some stories that, that, the, that the first wife, Elizabeth, wanted her husband to marry this charming young lady that they had taken into their home and entertained and enjoyed so much. And, and he did after Elizabeth's death. Now, Eliza's primary responsibility was to ensure the continued production of the rice crop with which George Lucas hoped to recoup his fortunes. But with her father's encouragement, Eliza, like many other low country planters, attempted to develop other crops. The most promising of these were mulberries for the feeding of silkworms and the production of luxury textile of silk, and indigo to meet the demand of Great Britain for the deep blue dye used in the growing English textile industry. 
Um, it was indigo that eventually became South Carolina's crucial second staple crop in the 18th century. And if you want, indigo and rice are wonderfully complementary crops. Um, indigo grows on high ground, uh, rice grows on low ground. Indigo needs um, labor at the time when the slave labor force that's dealing with the rice crop has some leisure time, although they develop specialties. So indigo turns out to be the perfect second staple crop. With the assistance of neighbors and technicians her father had sent from Antigua, Eliza first experimented with indigo in 1740. Now, she's 18 years old. The problem with indigo in South Carolina is not the growing of the plant, but the mastering of the complicated set of steps to convert its bluish green leaves and stalks into a deep blue dye. And I'm showing you the Muzan map of, um, I believe, 1785, because in the bottom of the cartouche for this map, all of the steps, you see the, you see the indigo crop growing in the fields, um, you see the three vats in which it's basically it's fermented. Um, and then after it's fermented, they drain the liquid out of it and they beat it. It's, it's a very complicated process. But, um, but it's that process that has stymied the English. The French had been doing it for years and guarded it as a secret. After several setbacks, Eliza produced a, her initial saleable crop of indigo in 1744, and that crop, she passed the seeds around, and, and she, well, the crop became her, do, her dowry at her marriage to Charles Pinckney in December of 1744, and he and she continued to promote the development and the growing of indigo. In fact, writing under the name of Agricola, Charles Pinckney wrote a number of articles encouraging other planters to grow the plant and describing how to manufacture the dye. Well, following her marriage to Charles Pinckney on December the 28th in 1744, her mom and sister were about to go back to Antigua, so the wedding was hurried up. Eliza moved from her family's Wapu plantation, and I love this portrait. This is at the Gibbs, and they very generously allowed me to use it in our online edition. Um, and it's, it's a wonderful mid-18th century portrait of a gentle, an English gentleman um, with his bald head and his cap. These, it's like one of the Kit Kat portraits that... But at any rate, this is about 1740, so about the time that Eliza married him. Um, they moved to um, his holding, plantation holding, at Belmont, and I, I can't see, it's up right up there, just up river from Charleston on the Cooper. Um, Eliza continued to be somewhat active in managing her father's plantation affairs in South Carolina, and we have some good evidence of that in our edition. But she concentrated after 1745 primarily on rearing three children, Charles Coatsworth, born in 1746, Harriet born in 1748, and Thomas born in 1750. She did have a fourth infant, uh, a child born in 1747. Um, the, the story is, and she writes, that she did not know her father had died and she was in advanced stages of pregnancy and when the news was brought to her that her father had died, um, she miscarried. I don't know whether that's medically possible. Some of you may be physicians. Would that be a strong enough impetus to miscarriage? But so, so there was, and that child was named George Lucas, the, the dead infant. From 1753 to 1758, the family lived in England, where Eliza reconnected with many of her school friends. She particularly enjoyed the London theater, and she traveled in the south of England to visit fashionable sites such as Bath. Charles Pinckney purchased a villa in the village of Ripley, southwest of London, in Surrey, as their home. And there, Eliza continued to correspond throughout her life with her Ripley neighbors. Charles Pinckney died in 1758, shortly after they returned to South Carolina. 
once again leaving Eliza in charge of plantation affairs and now the education of her children. Uh, her two sons remained in England. She and her daughter and husband came back to South Carolina, but the two boys were in England for another dozen years. Eliza and her, her, and her daughter Harriet lived again at Belmont where they continued agriculture and experimentation. And one of the things they did then, they, uh, Charles had begun some silk cultivation, um, but um, they took it back up again after they came back to South Carolina in 1758. And there's a wonderful article by a scholar from Scotland by the name of Benjamin Marsh. Um, it was published in just last November's um, Journal of Southern History. Uh, it's called Silk Hoax in South Carolina. And he describes at some length how important Eliza and Charles Pinckney were in the attempt to develop a silk industry in South Carolina. In fact, in 1755, when they were in England, um, Charles Pinckney presented a silk dress manufactured. Uh, this is not the one that was presented. That one no longer exists. I think this one is in, his, in the Smithsonian. But um, he presented to the Dowager Princess Augusta a silk dress that had been dyed with South Carolina indigo. So his daughter, well, his wife, was responsible for much of the manufacture of that. Sadly, the silk industry never really developed, um, and today the legacy of that industry can be seen in the mulberry trees that grow wild in the area along the Cooper River where Belmont once stood, uh, near what be became in the 20th century the Charleston Naval Station. Now, Eliza happily relinquished her responsibilities at Belmont when her oldest son, Charles Coatsworth, returned home from England in 1769 to claim his inheritance. He began a successful legal career in Charleston. He'd completed legal training at the Middle Temple um, in London. And after Charles Coatsworth came home, Eliza resided, resided partly at a home in Charleston and increasingly at her daughter Harriet Pinckney Laurie's Hampton Plantation. I'll talk more about that later. Particularly after, and, and I'm using these black and white images, Charles Coatsworth married um, Sarah or Sally Middleton in 1773, and uh, he and she um, became, lived at Belmont, and Eliza would go and visit them, of course. Um, um, Sally had, um, daughter and, and uh, briefly a son who only survived to about the age of two during the American Revolution. Eliza and her children supported the American patriot cause during the Revolutionary War and I have to say that the Revolutionary War was a very difficult time for her. Some of her most poignant letters are those describing to her friends in England the devastation and destruction of her home. Belmont was burned and has never recovered. Um, and her way of life. Um, slaves, and, slaves ran away or were captured. Um, livestock was slaughtered. Uh, she wrote in some embarrassment to a good friend um, of her inability to pay a debt, promising that she would eventually, but that she just described in detail all of the damage that had been done. Both her sons became first soldiers, then lawyers, then politicians, then diplomats and statesmen. My trivia question in the recent presidential election was what South Carolina family had two brothers who were the candidates for their party in four successive presidential elections? for either president or vice president? And the answer is the Pinckneys. Uh, Thomas and Charles Coatsworth were presidential candidates for the Federalists in 1796, uh, Thomas for vice president in 96, in 1800, 1804, and 1808. So four elections in a row. The Bushes might catch up. I don't know about that. But certainly, the Pinckneys hold the record so far. She was very proud of those 
young men, and she wrote with great pride in her letters of their accomplishments. And she enjoyed being a grandmother. I mean, she adored her oldest grandchild, Harriet Orie's son, Daniel. Um, when grandson Daniel went off to England at the age of 10 for his education, you could tell he was a beloved favorite because she sent him letters of grandmotherly advice, particularly when she heard from her English friends that he was in financial or educational trouble. And he did cut after her death. He was still pretty young when she died, but after her death, he cut a wide swath. He was in debt. He, the, his, the, the bootmaker and the everybody where he was in college at Cambridge kept saying, pay your debts. Um, he went off to France um, and most, and I, this isn't in my script, you see, I can't even stick to my script. The most wonderful set of 25 letters, um, which is in our edition, written in French. Um, he went off to France to study military um, uh, strategy and the, the French Revolution um, aftermath, the Napoleonic era caught up with him. He met, fell in love with, and married Lafayette's great niece. They settled in Paris, and they eventually bought um, a villa outside of Paris. Um, and, but see, he, t he owned the plantation which his mother was running, and so all of the letters are, Dear Mom, please send money. <laughs> Those of you who are parents and grandparents will find this a familiar theme. And we just chuckled as we, as we first transcribed and then translated. Dear Mom, this is why I am so much in need of more money. Can't you get it to me faster? Um, but I'm still telling you about Eliza. We'll get to Harriet later. By 1792, Eliza had developed breast cancer. And among the handful of letters that we included in the edition which were not written to or received by Eliza and Harriet are an exchange of letters between her sons, Charles Coatsworth, who was in South Carolina, and his brother Thomas, who in 1792 was sent to London to serve as the minister to the court of St. James or the predecessor to an ambassador to England about their mother's health. And in August of 1792, Charles Coatsworth wrote to Thomas, and I quote, we sent to the northward for leeches to apply to my mother's cancer, but Dr. Shippen says that there are none of the right sort. They have the same defect, these are in New England, that ours have, they're not sticking to the flesh. Could you not procure some and send them by a careful captain from England? As to preserve their lives, the water must be changed once a day at least so that, so that they will be in the water without dying. You can inquire on this subject from some experienced apothecary. So those of you who know people with breast cancer, imagine attaching leeches to the tumor to try to reduce it. By April of 1793, Charles Coatsworth reported to his brother in England, my sister and myself seeing our beloved mother growing weaker while the cancers, particularly the one under the arm, were continually increasing in size, joined warmly in the, in the requisition and entreated her to consent to a voyage to Philadelphia in order to try the efficacy of Dr. Tate's remedies, of which we have heard such high accounts. Um, Tate both administered various concoctions and um, he also performed surgery, uh, um, physically, surgically removing uh, cancerous breasts. Eliza dreaded traveling by ship because she had a chronic seasickness, but her children and doctors convinced her to make the journey, and on April the 10th of 1793, she set out with her daughter Harriet Orie and three of her granddaughters for Philadelphia but the disease was too far advanced. Tate never had the opportunity to attempt his surgical procedures. Um, Harriet's travel journal reports that the concoctions that he prescribed to shrink her tumors made her constantly sick to her stomach, and she died in Philadelphia on May the 26th. 
Uh, her importance to early America um, is noted by President Washington, who asked if he could be permitted to serve as one of her pallbearers at the funeral. She was buried the next day, May the 27th, in Philadelphia in St. Peter's Churchyard. Now, there's evidence in some of the family's financial records and correspondence that the family planned to remove her remains to Charleston for reburial. As far as we could find out, that never was carried out. But if you know anybody who knows Charleston cemeteries better than I do from Columbia, we would love to know whether Eliza's body was ever actually physically removed from St. Peter's Churchyard in Philadelphia and brought down here to South Carolina somewhere. There is evidence that they talked about it. Well, that's Eliza, overview of, of lovely lady. The second of my two first ladies is Harriet Pinckney. Harriet Pinckney Ori, the second child of Eliza and Charles Pinckney's three surviving children. She was born in South Carolina in August of 1748. When she was not quite five, her parents took her to England in the spring of 1753. And she lived there till she was almost 10. I'm going to share with you at some length a wonderful long document written by Eliza shortly after they arrived in England to an unknown friend written in 1753, because it involves Harriet. And I just imagine this not quite five-year-old. Shortly after the family arrived in England, Charles Pinckney arranged that he, Eliza, and Harriet should visit the royal family. Now, the Dowager Princess Augusta had settled at the Summer Palace at Kew. And you all know this now as Kew Gardens. She and her husband, uh, Prince, Fred, Prince um, Frederick, Prince of Wales, began Kew Garden. They were very interested in horticulture. He had died in 1751, and she moved with her eight children, ranging in age from two-year-old Caroline and three-year-old Frederick, to the future George III, who was then 16, and we're talking 1753. Small Harriet was supposed to bring a gift to the young princes and princesses of some Carolina birds. So this is portions of the letter. On the assigned day of their visit, they arrived a little late, I don't know why, and the princess was out walking and couldn't see them. We had, quote, we had carried the birds in the coach with us and we wrote a card to give the child in her hand in case we could not go in with her. Imagine sending a five-year-old to see the princess. 